All right, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ilya Vadalazov. I'm uh, the scientific secretary of the expert council at the Project Office for Arctic Development. Uh, today, it's a great honor for me to moderate a uh, discussion organized by the Gorchikov Foundation uh, in a series of meetings called Arctic Sessions. Today, we'll discuss <coughs> scientific cooperation and diplomacy in the Arctic. <coughs> I'm um, <coughs> happy to welcome our experts. We'll have three speakers. <laughs> we have Alexander Sergunin, professor at uh, St. Petersburg State University, Pavel Devyatkin, a research associate and uh, leadership group member at the Arctic Institute, and Professor Paul Berkman, associated fellow at the UN Institute for Training and Research. Uh, we will uh, give all our speakers about 20 minutes today. And then after that, uh, we'll have a Q&A session on the subject of scientific cooperation. And our viewers on YouTube, please send in your questions via chat. Okay, we are ready to start. And and our first speaker is Alexander Sergunin. Okay, I'm here. Uh, I would like to share my screen right now. Please let me know if you can see my slides. Just a second. Yes, we can see it. Can you see it? Okay, uh, let me switch to full screen. So you can see it, right? Yes, yes, it's perfect. Very well. Okay, I will speak in Russian, but to make life easier for our interpreters, my slides are in English. I think it will be uh, the best for everybody. Okay. Uh, my presentation will be somewhat theoretical. It may seem boring to you, but believe me, uh, as someone involved in uh, scientific uh, diplomacy, uh, definitions really mean a lot. This can really uh, help you be efficient uh, as a country. In our case, it's Russia, of course. So I will focus on three key matters. Number one, various approaches that uh, Russian scientists have to Arctic science diplomacy. Uh, second, uh, I will give a brief review of various platforms that exist for Arctic science diplomacy in Russia. And uh, third, very briefly, I will list a few priorities, a few priority areas for Arctic scientific diplomacy. Okay. Uh, first, let me give you a definition of uh, Arctic science diplomacy. And actually, I think Professor Berkman is going to talk about this more later on. Uh, this subject was first uh, brought up about more than 10 years ago at a conference, New Frontiers in Science Diplomacy, uh, organized uh, by the Royal Society in the UK and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, the conference took place in 2009. Its materials were published in 2010. So in those materials, uh, a preliminary definition of uh, scientific diplomacy was given. 
And three particular aspects were uh, identified. First, science and diplomacy, how uh, science can help in diplomacy. Number two, diplomacy for science. That's when diplomats help scientists to promote their projects, advance their research. And the number three, science for diplomacy. So science in diplomacy, diplomacy for science, and science for diplomacy. The third point is when you use scientific cooperation to improve relations between various countries. So there are these three dimensions. This is what uh, researchers and practitioners from various countries focus on. Uh, in this particular case, we're talking about the Arctic, of course, because the overall definition refers to <clears throat> scientific diplomacy in general. But uh, in this particular case, uh, you know, all these three experts, they don't always uh, work well and um, uh, they don't always apply. You have to take it on a case by case basis. Personally, I think uh, uh, this uh, describes the relationship between science and diplomacy. This is not the definition of scientific diplomacy per se. So now let me tell you about the Russian view of this issue, what the Russian scientists think about uh, science diplomacy and specifically Arctic science diplomacy. This is no longer a theoretic uh, definition. It's more practical and applied to uh, uh, this particular case. Uh, number one, an approach which I can call a technical or instrumentalist. Uh, basically, it equates uh, scientific diplomacy with a scientific cooperation. So to this approach, <clears throat> science diplomacy is uh, basically not that different from scientific cooperation. And uh, <coughs> adherents of the first approach are very practical. They just need, they think that uh, this could be used to enhance cooperation, get access to <coughs> scientific results, create databases. <laughs> so nothing special. Here is a diagram showing this relationships within this approach. You can see here how various bodies interact. Uh, they interact directly. There is no bureaucracy involved, no intermediaries. But now, five to seven years ago, in the Russian discourse on Arctic science diplomacy, a different approach began to gain traction. This second approach views science diplomacy as a soft power instrument or a smart power instrument. And this approach views science diplomacy as a, a secondary instrument to uh, 
arc the Arctic strategy in general. The, uh, this is about purpose, reaching certain uh, is foreign policy objectives by means of that tool. Our objectives so using this approach uh, is valuable Arctic not to science about diplomacy as a tool. Betting on the results of the scientific research, but rather this bets on the effect attained by that tool in terms of the foreign policy. So it means that in that case, this is about uh, promoting the image of Russia as a responsible stakeholder, as a practitioner, as the stakeholder which is open for the international cooperation in the field of science and other fields as well. And this approach is about creating a positive image of the country and improving its uh, scientific authority internationally. So it means that the those who propose that approach are subordinating uh, the Arctic science diplomacy to the foreign policy objectives. This graph shows how this approach is interpreting the science diplomacy for the sake of the foreign political objectives of the Russian Federation. And the final, the third approach, and uh, certainly I'm identifying this approach as um, a very general way. There might be some mixed ways to define these approaches, but for the sake of that presentation, I try to identify the pure approaches and types of the science diplomacy. So the third approach to the Arctic science diplomacy tends to interpret that not just as a tool within the soft power diplomacy, but rather this is a totally new type of diplomacy, which is different from the traditional diplomacy, which is aimed at the state, whereas the state is the main actor of the traditional diplomacy, whereas the science diplomacy, along with such things as culture diplomacy, economic diplomacy, environmental diplomacy, and others, for instance, uh, pa para diplomacy or digital diplomacy, para diplomacy embraces the subnational stakeholders and actors of a lower level than the state. But within the third approach, the Arctic science diplomacy should embrace a big range of stakeholders. And the bet should be made on the public tools, meaning that not just the state has to be identified uh, as the main stakeholder, but rather scientific and educational institutions have to come afore and play a big role, along with the NGOs and some network institutions. So these would be the main tools in contrast to the traditional diplomacy. This approach doesn't rule out the two previous approaches. This approach, which interprets uh, the Arctic science diplomacy as a public diplomacy or as a form of uh, public diplomacy, would include the technocratic and instrumentalist approach, meaning this is about expanding the international cooperation, but at the same time, it includes the interpretation of the public diplomacy as a form of soft power. On top of that, this is not just about expansion of the international scientific diplomacy or improving the image of the country or building the positive image of the country, but the goals are more ambitious, more aggressive, meaning improvement of the interstate relations. The use of that channel could be appropriate when other state-centric approaches are not affordable or accessible. And I would like to highlight this approach because it is today, if we look in the current context and the situation which has cropped out after the special military operations started, we see that most of the traditional diplomatic channels are severed, not because of Russia, but uh, other countries took that stance, trying to isolate Russia in the Arctic region and in the international regions which do exist. I mean, the Arctic Council, for instance, the Barents and uh, other councils, whereas Russia would be totally ignored and isolated, although 
we still have more than a year of presidency in the Arctic Council and in the Barents Council will assume presidentship end of 2023. I think that the contacts along the scientific lines would be the channel which we can use at the level of the non-governmental actors or at the level of the subnational actors. This is not a channel, but rather a creek which may help us to maintain a dialogue between different states and countries. Therefore, this third approach uh, in the modern situation amid the conflict between Russia and the West acquires more importance than before. I would like to highlight this very approach. This scheme shows the Arctic science diplomacy as a means of the Russia's public diplomacy. The main feature of that approach is that uh, the accent would be made not on the state or public institutions, but uh, rather on the non-governmental or non-state or subnational actors, such as the regional, original actors, the cities, different municipal entities and institutions. So here is a table which helps you to compare these three theoretical approaches to ASD. And we see that they are complementary. And first of all, the new diplomacy or public diplomacy is a form of the Arctic science diplomacy would embrace the two previous approaches. If you're interested in the slides, I can ask the organizers to disseminate them so that you can study them in more detail. Let me now proceed with the two remaining parts of my presentation. I will tell you in a nutshell about the venues and platforms. Certainly, this is about the Arctic Council. This is BEAC, Northern Forum, which embraces uh, northern regions of different countries, different uh, regimen, such as the regional fishery regimen. And in the framework of these regimen or institutions, a lot has been done in order to keep track of uh, the fish migration and to keep track of the maritime environment. A big work would be done there by means of uh, huge scientific teams. And very often, this form of uh, public diplomacy is uh, forgotten, which is not fair. The second type of the institutions, so this is about the international scientific organizations or associations. First of all, this is about IASC, starting from 1990s. It has a special platform which in English is called ISIRE. It helps the foreign scientists to get to the Russian polar stations of different types. And this program played an immense role in making sure that the Russian polar science is an international one so that the foreign academics uh, and uh, researchers could uh, get access to the Russian polar stations. And this program is still on, although certain restrictions were imposed starting from the COVID times. And there are some visa problems and uh, there are problems uh, getting access to these polar stations that started uh, from the 24th of February, but still the work goes on. Next organization, this is about uh, the ISSA, the International Association of Social Studies. This is an intergovernmental committee, IPCC, the WMO, the Arctic University, which is a network one. And certainly this list could be continued. The broad of these scientific organizations is uh, is bigger. And although some of these professional organizations, such as, uh, for instance, 
IASC and IASSA, and there are some others adopted a resolution condemning the Russia's actions in Ukraine and would impose a certain restrictions on cooperating with the Russian societies, but they are de facto cooperating with Russia, but not at the level of R&D institutes, but rather on an individual level, one on one. Another platform includes different Russian Arctic fora, starting from the main one, uh, the Arctic as a territory of a dialogue. Before the COVID, it was a biennial one. The latest one was held in 2019 in St. Petersburg. It was a, a huge event, which brought together several thousand people, a lot of businessmen, journalists, and uh, public leaders uh, from abroad came there. But unfortunately, starting from 2019, now for uh, uh, where it would take place for the COVID restrictions and now for political reasons. It was scheduled for April 2022, but the sanctions against uh, the Russian scientists were imposed and the international leaders also refused to attend that forum. Also, St. Petersburg is home to another forum, which is called the Arctic, the past and the present and the future, which is being held by uh, the Russian polar scientists. It is spearheaded by Mr. Chilingarov, and uh, before it was an international one, but now for the well-known political reasons, it is attended by uh, Russian academics only, and uh, some foreign scientists would come there in their uh, personal capacity. Scientists from South Korea, from Singapore, and from some Eastern countries. And the last but not least, that's the International Arctic Forum, which before the COVID-19 and before the Russia's special operation in Ukraine played a big role. And the biggest one there is an annual forum, which is called Arctic Circle, which is held every October in Reykjavik, capital of uh, one of the Nordic countries, uh, but for 2020, when it was uh, cancelled uh, for the COVID restrictions. And the politicians, the businessmen, and the scientists, uh, the journalists, and uh, representatives of uh, the indigenous uh, people would come there. That's a very useful, very interesting event. All the, these sectors are part and parcel of each other, totally. Uh, inseparable and therefore this platform is very good for the arctic science diplomacy in terms of exchanging data setting contacts and identifying new projects unlike similar fora it is not yet closed for the russian scientists this autumn Another such forum would take place, and uh, some Russian scientists would attend that uh, from St. Petersburg, from Moscow, from my organization. So this is a little window of opportunity, of opportunity which remains nowadays. And Arctic Frontiers is another quite respected and authoritative forum. It was scheduled for April, now it's been postponed. It it's been held in the city of Tomsø in the north of Norway, in the premises of the Arctic Institute of Norway. It is still open for the Russian scientists and uh, many who wants and who has money to attend it uh, make go there, although the entry fee is quite expensive and uh, the flight and accommodation also are quite expensive. So it means that uh, instead of uh, the iron curtain, you would find some silver or gold curtain there. So meaning that if you don't have enough money or if you have no access to grants in order to attend that forum, it would be very difficult to get money to get there. This forum 
is a kind of an elite club, a closer one, unlike the polo circle, which is held in Reykjavik, but for professionals. That's of some interest as well. So these are the two main fora. There are fora offer less scale, for instance, the one which has been held in Norway, which is aimed at business representatives, which will bring together the people who specialize in business management, etc. That's another forum which is uh, open for everyone. International Arctic Scientific uh, Committee holds the so-called uh, the International Arctic Week. And uh, in March, it was held in Tromsø, Norway. And the Russian delegation was banned from attending that, although the Russian scientists uh, filed their applications, but these applications were turned down. I think that it was the position of the Norwegian committee, which is part of that international committee that prevailed. And uh, next year, the session of that committee would be held in Austria, and probably it would more welcome the Russian delegations. This is everything I wanted to tell about uh, different ASD venues and platforms. And the last slide, this is about the priority areas sir, for the scientific cooperation. First of all, we focus on the climate change action and development of different strategies to prevent or mitigate the climate change, to adapt for the climate change. And even another controversial area as uh, climate engineering, when uh, people try to influence the weather, the environment, the nature, in order to prevent uh, further climate change. And um, this is not supported by the international legal acts. Another area of priority is environment uh, protection, glaciology and permafrost, conservation of biodiversity, rational use of natural resources, the so-called uh, green and blue economies, I mean, environmentally friendly economies, maritime and uh, onshore ones, bring about resilient local communities, including indigenous peoples. Of the last several years, another popular area was integration of the conventional knowledge into the pure academic research. And it turned out that uh, the pure academic knowledge may uh, copy and paste a lot from the indigenous knowledge, uh, from the people who living many centuries in the far north uh, have accumulated a lot of skills and knowledge that can be used for the scientific purposes. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Alexander, for a very good overview of uh, the venues and platforms. Pavel Dvyatkin will be our next speaker. Pavel? Thank you very much, Ilya. Thank you very much, Alexander Anatolievich. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Great. Thank you very much yeah, for the invitation to present in this session about uh, Arctic science cooperation. Um, I'm going to focus on examples and prospects regarding the U.S.-Russia relationship, especially in the area of climate science and environmental studies. And so despite the difficult circumstances, there are still many that would agree that science cooperation between our countries to understand pressing issues in the Arctic 
especially those related to climate change and environmental protection are not any less important. And so in the last uh, seminar of the series of discussions, the Arctic sessions, which I had the honor to moderate, we heard some pessimistic views on science cooperation, but some experts also emphasized uh, the success of Arctic cooperation, even through periods of heightened tensions, such as the Ukraine crisis in 2014. And so today I speak as a representative of the Arctic Institute, a research organization in Washington, D.C. that's devoted to informing policy for a peaceful Arctic. We strongly support science diplomacy and international science cooperation uh, between researchers. And we just had our first ever academic conference in June, and it was a great success with many participants from around the world, and especially many students from Russia. Uh, Russian university students there presented their research on U.S.-Russia cooperation in sustainable development. And we had some experts give lectures, uh, experts such as Cynthia Lazaroff, who's a peace activist famous in the, in the area of U.S.-Russia relations, who spoke about the continued importance of diplomacy in dealing with the climate crisis and the continued importance of preventing nuclear war. So there are still many people around the world and across many generations who believe in maintaining dialogue and cooperation. Um, I like to start my discussions of U.S.-Russia uh, relations in the Arctic by recognizing that we share a long history of scientific dialogue. Um, and uh, um, the science dialogue between the U.S. and Russia began to influence um, diplomatic relations as early as the 18th century. In a letter to Mikhail Lomonosov, uh, Benjamin Franklin, together with uh, Yale scholar Ezra Stiles, asked his polymathic Russian counterpart for an account of the discoveries of the polar voyage. And so Lomonosov had taken part in the great northern expeditions of the 18th century and written extensively about oceanography and the Aurora Borealis. And though it's unclear whether Lomonosov ever received this letter, uh, it's, and it's not necessarily a form of science diplomacy or science cooperation, this kind of correspondence still indicates that important American and Russian scientists, even as far back as the 18th century, were interested in sharing findings even before the U.S. declared independence. Uh, another example of important U.S.-Russia cooperation in the Arctic uh, is the International Polar Year of 1882 to 1883. The U.S. and Russia joined 10 other countries during the IPY to collect data on Arctic sea ice, meteorology, and the Aurora Borealis. The IPY was especially inspired by the Austro-Hungarian explorer Karl Weiprecht, who was an advocate of international expeditions. He said that when countries that consider themselves to be advanced in terms of scientific progress decide to work together, they completely eliminate any national competition. And so instead of competing, Weiprecht called on countries such as the US and Russia to collaborate uh, towards advancing knowledge, human knowledge of, of certain scientific areas. Uh, during the IPY, research stations were constructed across the Arctic, and you can see a map of some of these, uh, including in Nova Zemlya in Russia and Point Barrow in Alaska. Um, these places today would be considered militarily sensitive, uh, but back then it was, it was fine to establish joint research uh, stations in these areas. And so initiatives such as the first IPY and also the second IPY that came after set the stage for an inclination to cooperate with other countries during the Cold War, but political differences initially hindered um, successful efforts. One of, one of the most important collaborations of the Cold War was the 1957 to 1958 International Geophysical Year, or the IGY, uh, also known as the third IPY. After Nikita Khrushchev's reforms, the president of the USSR Academy of Sciences agreed in 1953 to include the Soviet Union in this initiative, the IGY, and created a special uh, body to coordinate the Soviet Union's participation. Meanwhile, in the United States, researchers also played a very important role in encouraging American participation 
especially by stressing the diplomatic benefits. For example, the American physicist Lloyd Berkner uh, appealed to the U.S. government about the need for scientific expertise to inform foreign policy. He argued that participating in the IGY could help to ease tensions between the U.S. and Soviet Union. And if it did not, Berkner said that at least we will have obtained good science results. And so in this sense, even during the Cold War, uh, collaborative science was still seen as a worthwhile pursuit regardless of policy objectives. Uh, during the IGY, there are over 40 research stations uh, in the Arctic, uh, which studied high latitude weather, sea ice movement and aurora borealis, and, um, and its effect on radio interference. And you can see a map of, of the 40 IGY research stations, most of which were in the USSR. Uh, and on the right, that's also part of the IGY, but that's an, um, a photo of American and Soviet scientists in Antarctica. The Cold War is generally remembered as this period of mutually assured destruction and geopolitical tensions. It was also the time of detente as researchers, scientific communities and concerned citizens from both the US and Russia uh, worked hard to bridge differences. This, uh, this competitive and rivalrous nature of the Cold War also had this inadvertent effect of facilitating East-West convergence over ecological concerns and what could be called a militarization of the environment. This political struggle between the U.S. and the Soviet Union created an atmosphere where the environment was seen as another battlefield of ideological competition and virtuous ecological achievements were highlighted to show one socio-political system's advantages over the other. It was in this bipolar structure of the international system that there were global pressures from from other countries to support environmentalist policy. International concerns from the non-aligned countries over environmental degradation played an important role in pressuring the two superpowers to demonstrate their system's environmentalist superiority, as well as uh, develop mutually advantageous forms of cooperation. And the final years of the Cold War coincided with perestroika and the uh, rise of environmentalism in international affairs. During the 1986 and 1988 Reagan-Gorbachev summits in Reykjavik and Moscow, um, there were high-level discussions of ecological concerns. The joint statement from the 1988 Moscow summit especially reaffirmed the leaders, quote, support for expanded bilateral and regional contacts and increased scientific and environmental cooperation. This is an example of diplomacy for science, which eventually produced a joint research report titled Prospects for Future Climate in 1990. This joint report alerted scientists to rising temperatures and changing weather in high latitudes and produced very important findings uh, compared to had the research been conducted just unilaterally. As the Cold War came to an end, the relations between scientists proved to be one of the significant channels of trust building that spilled over into the political and military spheres in the form of arms reduction talks. And so U.S. and Soviet or Russian tensions eased and scientific cooperation gradually entered uh, these more sensitive fields such as oceanography and, uh, the, um, and the study of the extraction of, uh, of natural resources. So in a way, Arctic science and collaboration in Arctic science opened the door to further forms of cooperation. <clears throat> After the Cold War, uh, the period from the early 2000s until around 2014 saw the height of U.S.-Russia Arctic cooperation. There was the creation of new agencies and, um, and government bodies that were made to better distribute the Russian state's environmentalist responsibilities between 1996 and 2004. And this coincided with the easing of barriers to foreign researchers hoping to study the Russian Arctic, which had been basically closed off to the majority of Western researchers during the Cold War.
One of the early initiatives that brought American researchers to the Russian Arctic was the Russian American Initiative for the um, uh, for Land Shelf Environments, or RAIS. This was between 1995 and 2006. It was supported by the National Science Foundation and the Russian Foundation for Basic Research. Around this time as well, the National Science Foundation doubled its funding for Russian Arctic research and scientific exchanges from about $170 million to $352 million. And as Alexander Anatolievich uh, mentioned in his presentation, the International Science Initiative in the Russian Arctic, ISIRA, was also set up around this time within the framework of the International Arctic Science Committee, the IASC, to promote research projects in the Russian Arctic and improve access to foreign researchers in the region. So this RAISE program uh, had a specific objective to facilitate U.S.-Russia cooperation for the improvement of relations. Between 2011 and 2014, um, an example of, um, of how uh, this form of Arctic cooperation spilled into other initiatives in the Arctic, uh, between 2011 and 2014, researchers from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, convinced experts from the Russian Ministry of Natural Resources and Ecology about the health risks of black carbon in northern communities. In accordance with <clears throat> U.S. scientific uh, uh, diplomatic objectives, the Russian government proceeded to then fund a black carbon emissions in inventory that was based on methodologies provided by the EPA. During this time, the bilateral presidential commission that was created by Presidents Obama and Medvedev in 2009 deepened cooperation and created various working groups uh, focused on science and the environment. So these are some, of, some examples of science diplomacy, the interface of foreign policy and science cooperation, or diplomats encouraging transnational science. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, prime examples that I want to discuss um, that emerged out of this bilateral presidential commission uh, is the Russian-American long-term consensus of the Arctic, or Rusalka for short, which can be translated to mermaid in Russian. Uh, Rusalka um, became one of the main initiatives of the fourth uh, IPY between 2007 and 2008. Across several expeditions to the Bering and Chukchi Seas between 2004 and 2015, Russian and American scientists studied the marine chemistry, uh, glaciology, oceanography, and ecosystems of the Pacific Arctic. And it's seen um, as an exemplar, Ruzalka um, um, is seen as an exemplar of U.S.-Russia Arctic science diplomacy because it, pro um, it produced very valuable knowledge while grappling with turbulent political tensions. The start of the program coincided with uh, President Putin's famous 2007 speech at the Munich Security Conference, where the Russian president stressed Russia's dissatisfaction with the unipolar world, as well as the Russo-Georgian War of 2008. And so, considering that uh, Rusalka was not concluded until many years after these tensions, the significance of the scientific findings were evidently more important than any political uh, disagreements. One of the Russian coordinators of Rusalka, Alexei Ostrovsky, said in an interview, since our research is important for all of humanity, we managed to avoid the possible negative impact on the project of some individual contradictions between politicians. The scientists of the project concentrate on what unites them, science, and we had and still have excellent relations with our American colleagues. That was um, um, a Russian coordinator of Rusalka. So the, uh, the project, uh, Rusalka, uh, produced models and findings that eventually helped produce other future climate forecasts. Researchers highlighted the practical benefits of merging proficiencies of Russian and American scientists. Russian scientists, for example, expressed that they were lucky to work with, with the American colleagues, um, excellent expeditionary equipment and world-class instruments, while the Russians reciprocated with their superior icebreaker capabilities. The U.S. Coast Guard currently has two uh, operational polar 
capable icebreakers, whereas Russia has dozens. So this is an example of, of, of one of the benefits of science cooperation, the merging of proficiencies, of capabilities. In May 2014, the U.S. National Security Council granted an exemption in support of Rusalpa's operations in the aftermath of the 2014 Ukraine crisis. However, the July 2014 expedition met complications after the, uh, um, at the American side, lost connection with the program's Russian coordinators and resources were subsequently restrained. So the tensions contributed to perceptions among U.S. researchers about the challenges of working with Russia in the Arctic um, but nonetheless, these exemptions of Rusalka and associated projects uh, show that scientific collaboration is still constructive, but requires very careful planning to overcome any barriers. And this is where science diplomacy, or the role of diplomats and policymakers advancing, advancing such initiatives, advancing science cooperation, can play a constructive role. Uh, so, talking a little bit more generally, the Ukraine crisis of 2014 had a negative impact on U.S.-Russia relations in the Arctic, but there were still some examples of science cooperation that we can still learn from in considering the current situation. There are now fears that science diplomacy is dead in the Arctic. Um, the escalation of the conflict in, in 2022 severely strained Arctic cooperation. Seven of the Arctic Council member states condemned Russia's actions in Ukraine and called for a pause of the Arctic Council's work during Russia's chairmanship. Arctic Council working and expert groups have been halted. And although Arctic scientists continue to work on research at the individual level, uh, and I've been talking about climate science, uh, but of course in social sciences and other, and other uh, areas of Arctic science, there's still individual to individual uh, dialogue and cooperation. But um, there have been uh, calls from other Arctic uh, states officials, such as uh, Norway's senior Arctic official, that there should be no exchange of data or official publishing. So many other Arctic organizations, such as the IASC, the International Arctic Science Committee, likewise criticized Russia and, and or paused uh, their work. Uh, and whereas Russian Arctic officials called the suspension regrettable, and declared uh, that it was important to preserve the activities of the of the Arctic Council so that when circumstances allow, cooperation can continue without prejudice for those who depend on these projects, uh, there's still a lot of pessimism. I think it's interesting, though, that John Kerry, who is serving as Biden's climate change envoy, uh, expressed hope that President Putin would, quote, stay on track in combating climate change. Uh, he said this in the opening um, in the opening days of the escalation in, in February. And so we can see that in working towards improving Arctic science diplomacy, it's important to consider all these challenges and different conditions and different views from policymakers and scientists. Science diplomacy is essential for maintaining science cooperation and that when science diplomacy breaks down, science cooperation itself deteriorates as well. In this case, science diplomacy holds the key to reigniting science cooperation once the discord around Ukraine is resolved. Um, there, there are many uh, calls from scientists um, to, uh, to remember these examples of, of cooperation and diplomacy even during tensions such as during the Cold War. Um, I, I saw an article in the, in the magazine Nature that was headlined, For the Climate's Sake, keep Arctic communication open. Uh, that's because much of the research and data sharing related to the Russian Arctic is currently on hold. So finally, I want to talk a little about, about um, uh, prospects looking towards the future. Um, the 2021 uh, International Arctic Science Committee State of, the, of Arctic Science Report concluded that data coverage and availability of data from the Russian Arctic remains particularly lacking and that more international studies are needed. So there's a lack of funding stability, infrastructural support, and research that's co-produced with indigenous and traditional knowledge. Incorporating uh, indigenous knowledge as an equal form of science while respecting research ethics and data sovereignty 
and social science collaboration in general may produce solid opportunities for US-Russia Arctic science diplomacy and cooperation as we look towards the, uh, the medium-term future. <clears throat> Russia has, has designated indigenous people as a focus area for its Arctic Council chairmanship, and the US National Science Foundation has a program called Navigating the New Arctic, which emphasizes co-production with indigenous knowledge holders in his research. And so the co-management of the Alaska Chukotka polar bear population by native organizations of, of both sides may serve as a model for further forms of scientific cooperation looking towards the future. I have some pictures on the screen of uh, the effects of permafrost thaw in the Russian and American Arctic. Um, permafrost is one of the essential scientific research areas that necessitate, that demand expanded US-Russia cooperation, as well as co-production with indigenous knowledge holders. Permafrost is the frozen layer of soil that lies beneath the Arctic tundra, and it's thawing with severe consequences. The thaw is releasing greenhouse gases, damaging infrastructure, and potentially unearthing ancient pathogens that could harm the Arctic ecosystem. And there remain substantial knowledge gaps and a lack of observational data. While individual Arctic nations have successful permafrost research programs, the lack of data sharing significantly reduces the overall efficiency of understanding permafrost and its effect on the Arctic ecosystem. Effective data sharing should be real-time, open access, and based on um, cohesive models. And so US-Russia cooperation in permafrost research is another case where pooling capabilities can have significant results because there are mutual threats of thawing permafrost in both the Russian North and Alaska. Um, it's in both nations' interest to combine the U.S.'s uh, sophisticated research com um, uh, competencies and capabilities in studying permafrost with Russia's centuries-long expertise in studying permafrost. You can see on the screen uh, some photos from the U.S. and Russian Arctic on the left, um, methane bubbles up from thawed permafrost, um, a photo taken by the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And the right is a photo in the New York Times, um, and that's a man standing in front of a crater after an explosion caused by a thaw in permafrost, uh, um, and that uh, the New York Times called it, land in Russia's Arctic blows like a bottle of champagne. These methane explosions create craters in parts of the Russian Arctic, such as in the Yamal Peninsula. Uh, carbon dioxide is, is the biggest greenhouse gas, but methane has an 80 times uh, higher warming potential than carbon dioxide in the long term. Um, and so methane stays in the atmosphere only 12 years, whereas carbon dioxide 100 years. So cutting methane could be a priority and it could be time for, um, for the development of an agreement uh, on reducing methane emissions in the Arctic. Um, this is another area um, for U.S.-Russia cooperation. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I've, I've uh, shared a few examples of um, U.S.-Russia Arctic science cooperation in history, uh, current challenges, and some prospects looking to the future. Um, thank you very much. Back to you, Ilya. Thank you so much, Pavel, for your historic overview, for showing in your report that, in essence, our international cooperation has never stopped. Thank you so much. And our next speaker is Paul Bergman. Can you hear us, Mr. Bergman? Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. Uh, please excuse my inability to speak in Russian. Um, I'd like to thank the project office for Arctic development for the opportunity to contribute to this discussion. Um, my comments will largely be uh, spoken. Um, I did not prepare slides in the sense of seeking to communicate broadly um, with those that are listening, um, hopefully from many nations in terms of this discussion. Um, before beginning, I'd like to uh, follow on the comments um, made by both Alexander and Pavel uh, in terms of leading into my observations as well. Um, Alexander 
thoughtfully went through the history of science diplomacy um, and by way of definition. So make sure we're all on the same plate. Science diplomacy is a process. It's an international, interdisciplinary, and inclusive process, noting that inclusion is by far and away the biggest challenge. This process operates with informed decision-making. It operates across a continuum of urgencies, short to long-term. The process has a purpose to build common interests, to balance national interests among nations, to balance national interests and common interests, ultimately for the benefit of all on earth across generations. When we speak of the Arctic, we are talking about humanity. We are talking about the earth system. We are talking about survival of all on earth across generations. The context that, that Alexander mentioned with the Royal Society report uh, coincided during the 50th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty, during which, along with colleagues from many nations, I convened a summit in Washington, D.C. to celebrate lessons of the 50th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty. These two meetings that happened simultaneously or nearly simultaneously in 2009, and I was at both, um, have in effect two different purposes. Um, and they're intertwined in terms of science diplomacy. The Royal Society meeting, which is more often discussed and much better known, uh, talks about what is science diplomacy, science for diplomacy, diplomacy for science, science in diplomacy. That's helpful. It awakened interest of ministries of foreign affairs around the world in science diplomacy. What is science diplomacy? The meeting that I convened in Washington had a different purpose in celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty. It asked, how does science diplomacy operate? And for me, this was a very personal journey. I wintered in Antarctica when I was 22, scuba diving under the ice in the region you can see behind me in this picture for a year. And one of the questions that I asked during that winter when I was 22 was, why did the United States and the Soviet Union cooperate continuously in Antarctica as well as outer space throughout the Cold War, despite the animosities that isolated them everywhere else on Earth. That question has been at the core of my entire professional development for the last 40 years. Initially, I thought it was, as, as Pavel thoughtfully introduced, it was related to the International Geophysical Year. 60,000 scientists from around the world came together during the International Geophysical Year to study the Earth system. The national security item that was on the table with the International Geophysical Year was satellites. Even so, the United States and the Soviet Union cooperated during the, so, during the International Geophysical Year, and it led to the Antarctic Treaty. And I thought for many years that science was the essence of why the United States and the Soviet Union cooperated continuously in Antarctica, as well as outer space throughout the Cold War. However, it was only more recently, within the last five years, really, stemming from the Arctic Science Agreement itself, the agreement on enhancing international Arctic scientific cooperation that was signed in 2017 with the eight Arctic states foreign ministers in, in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is now in force. I thought it was science. And the observation eventually emerged that the starting point for the dialogue between the United States and the Soviet Union in the 1950s were matters of common interest. The Antarctic Treaty that was created became the first nuclear arms agreement to reach that point for the United States and the Soviet Union as superpower adversaries meant they had to look beyond 
above national interests. Those national interests prevented dialogues. They created the animosities that existed throughout the Cold War. The common interests that existed between the United States and the Soviet Union still exist. They are simply a matter of survival of all on Earth across generations. So this, this discussion, the opening comments from, from Pavel and, and Alexander provide an important entree into the observations that I would like to share. Now, we live at a moment, a very difficult moment, and I will borrow from the Arctic Council itself. I will not deal with military security issues. So, recognizing there is a war in Ukraine, recognizing that Russia invaded Ukraine, my comments will not deal with military security in the same spirit of the Arctic Council itself. The Arctic Council is a special high-level forum. And Pavel introduced and showed a picture of Gorbachev and Reagan together in the 1980s. In 1987 in Murmansk, Gorbachev gave a very important speech. It's a famous speech. It's a, it's a rare speech because it represents a president, a head of state, speaking not in terms of national interests, but in terms of common interests, in terms of humanity. Gorbachev in his 1987 speech recognized the burning security issues. Those burning security issues are still existing in the Arctic. They're underwater. It's not the bombers overhead or the boots on the ground or things that we can take pictures of. The risks in the Arctic Ocean are underwater. Make no mistake, they have been there since the early 1960s and they are the most severe risks humankind faces today. Unilateral with hypersonic missiles from under the water, North America, Europe, and Asia. I will not deal with military security issues, as I said, but this is the circumstance, this is the context that we're talking about. We are living during a period when risks exist for all humanity everywhere on Earth because of nuclear weapons. Let's call it what it is. The discussion here is important because it provides a path to stabilize, to rebuild trust, and to think short-term to long-term. So in defining science diplomacy, I identified that it was a matter of informed decision-making. Informed decision-making by itself is a word, but to define it, an informed decision operates across a continuum of urgencies. That continuum of urgencies exists from a security timescale when there are risks of instability, political, economic, cultural instability that are immediate, that any government will address as a security issue. But we also have urgencies that operate across generations in terms of issues that operate on a planetary scale, such as climate. Climate has a time scale of decades to centuries. The path that we're on is for the future of humanity, decades to centuries in the future. It is beyond the political gyrations that paralyze progress in the world. So in this sense, I'd like to, to speak about science diplomacy, not in terms of a theoretical, but in terms of practical, how it operates. And with hope and inspiration that we can, as a community, with the Arctic, all Arctic states and non-Arctic states who are interested together, bring transformation in the world that will operate short-term to long-term. So in that sense, in thinking about this process, this international, interdisciplinary, and inclusive process, I'd like to focus on the questions 
of inclusion. What is inclusion? And inclusion itself has six elements, and they're pretty obvious elements, but I'm going to share them with you anyway. Who, what, when, where, how, and why. And I will address each of those six elements of inclusion in the context of international scientific cooperation. My background in this is as a science diplomat. I'm not anointed with special plenipotentiary powers given to me by a government, but I operate as a science diplomat. I operate with presidents and prime ministers. I talk with parliaments. I talk with generals and admirals around the world. The ability to dialogue isn't a matter of power. It's a matter of facilitating a dialogue. How do we do that? It's not a matter of us telling each other what is right and what is wrong, and the world is yelling at each other. Nobody's listening because everybody's right and everybody's wrong. How do we reset that dialogue? That's the question. The question is at the basis of the progress that's required. If we begin with questions, we can open dialogues that were otherwise impossible. And I, I, in the in the in the space of listening to both Pavel and Alexander, and I said I didn't prepare slides, and I didn't. But I will share with you if I have a moment. Uh, I'll go away from sites. In 2010, with colleagues at Mgimo University, we hosted the first formal dialogue between NATO and Russia. Now, NATO countries couldn't convene this dialogue. Russia couldn't convene this dialogue. They were paralyzed by their geopolitics. But a group of scientists was able to convene the first formal dialogue between NATO and Russia in 2010, while I was a a distinguished scholar, Fulbright scholar at the University of Cambridge. That dialogue with Professor Alexander Vilikjanin at Mgimo University produced a book called Environmental Security in the Arctic Ocean. Arturo Cherlingarov has a, has a contribution in it himself, in Russian, translated into English. That book, Environmental Security in the Arctic Ocean, the ability to convene a dialogue between the two superpower adversaries happened from an individual that isn't a plenipotentiary ambassador or, or minister. It happened with the finesse of starting with questions, questions that could be addressed openly, inclusively, and the goal wasn't to come up with recommendations or even options. The goal was simply to progress to questions of common concern. And from that point, to continue building common interests among allies and adversaries alike. The methodology, the skills, the, the theory of informed decision making simply that an informed decision operates across a continuum of urgencies is scalable. The scalability of this operates at subnational, national, and international levels. That's the theory, something that we can continuously test. The application of informed decision making is immediate and direct. And I'll give you an immediate example. In, two, in February of this year, funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan and hosted by the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, a group of us convened a dialogue on enhancing international scientific cooperation. Enhancing, not just protecting or supporting, but enhancing in the same spirit as the Arctic Science Agreement itself, focusing specifically on ministries, at the time, we were thinking in terms of ministries of science and ministries of foreign affairs. And certainly after the dialogue began on the 21st of February, the relevance of ministries became ministries of defense as well. The dialogue started on the first 21st of February. And on the 24th of February, the war in Ukraine began. And the dialogue continued. 
It continued on the 10th of March and it continued on the 24th of March. It had people like the president of the International Arctic Science Committee. It had people like former ambassador of Russia, who was a senior Arctic official and subsequently ambassador in Iceland, inclusively thinking in terms of common interests. So if we talk about international scientific cooperation and we talk about it in terms of being practical, and I applaud the Project Office for Arctic Development for its series, as an attempt to go beyond the isolation, the exclusion that currently exists. So in thinking about inclusion, when, what, when, where, why, and how, I'd like to start with when, and the observation that when operates across time. So in a simple sense, if we operate across time, this dialogue that we're having today, the second dialogue, builds on the first dialogue. And the first dialogue, which was recently convened, involved Ambassador and, uh, Nikolai Korchunov. Ambassador Korchunov made several observations. And so if we're going to continue and build science diplomacy, then we also have to continue in the spirit of observations that have been made previously. Those observations in, uh, included, and, and you know, to be fair, I think it's an accurate observation that, that Ambassador Kurchunov made. The spillover effect, quote unquote, that, that, that caused the pause in the Arctic Council hadn't happened before. There have been other wars, uh, certainly since 1996 when the Arctic Council was established, but it was Ukraine in specific that, that caused this pause. The observation of indigenous peoples being held hostage, that is certainly a case. The indigenous peoples existed long before there were ever nations who asserted boundaries in the Arctic. And these peoples represented by the six indigenous peoples organizations that signed the Arctic uh, the signed to the Arctic Council. They exist across the Arctic, but are prevented from asserting issues of food security and other natural rights that they have as indigenous peoples. It was observed that the pause, pausing is easy, but it's far more difficult to reassert that process, to rebuild trust. And if we are going to rebuild trust, where is it going to come from? It's not going to come from the nations who are paralyzed with nationalism and national interests. It's not going to come from national leaders. It's going to come from the scientific community. The trust is going to come from the scientific community. The trust that exists still exists, as evidenced by my participating in this in this conversation, is the important thing to maintain and rebuild. And it will happen because of leadership from the scientific community. Ambassador Korchunov made no predictions about the future of the Arctic Council. And to think about the future of the Arctic Council, we have to be practical. And I would say that one of the opportunities of the Pora dialogues is to be practical. The practical feature of the Arctic Council pause talks about specifically, and I'm gonna read a component of the joint statement of Arctic Council cooperation following Russia's invasion of Ukraine it was signed on the 3rd of March by seven Arctic states without Russia. We remain convinced of the enduring value of the Arctic Council for circumpolar cooperation and reiterate our support for this institution and its work. This is an opportunity to hold all Arctic states accountable for that very statement. We hold responsibility to the people of the Arctic, including the indigenous peoples who contribute to and benefit from the, under, the important work of the Arctic Council. That observation of the importance of the Arctic Council is unquestionable. 
It exists across all of the Arctic states. That in itself is a common interest. If we look at that statement further in terms of what it means and to think in terms of practical, not just theoretical, but practical, how do we as a scientific community help the cooperation continue? How do we enhance international scientific cooperation? The statement goes on to say, consideration of the necessary, quote unquote, modalities that can allow us to continue the council's important work in view of the current circumstances. What are those necessary modalities? How do we move from the present into a period when all of the eight Arctic states are working together again? When all of the working groups are functional, when dialogues among indigenous peoples are open and uncomplicated, when individuals and research institutions aren't concerned about being jeopardized in terms of their careers if they talk with colleagues in other countries. How do we move beyond that? What are the necessary modalities for the Arctic Council? I would make a simple observation. A necessary modality for the Arctic Council is the effective passing of the torch between chairmanships. The current chairmanship of the Arctic Council is with Russia until 2023. The opportunity and the challenge that exists in terms of necessary modalities is for Russia to hand the chairmanship over to Norway in 2023. Now, if we think about circumstances that make this complicated and precedents that exist, even when the ministers, the Arctic Council ministerial meeting are unable to meet together and reach consensus, which has happened with the Finnish chairmanship when Secretary of State Mike Pompeo made a very bombastic speech about climate. The United States wasn't going to sign anything associated with climate and all of the Arctic states felt compelled that climate was important. There was no consensus statement from the Arctic Council states together. As a consequence, to keep the Arctic Council operational, to pass the torch to Iceland, there was a statement from the chairman of the Arctic Council. This responsibility falls on Ambassador Korchunov. But in terms of the political dynamic, we as a community have a lot to do to support that transition, to maintain the integrity of the Arctic Council. If there is no passing of the torch, if there is no continuation of chairmanships from Russia to Norway, then the Arctic Council doesn't exist. It has stopped. At the moment, it is paused. A necessary modality for the Arctic Council, as identified in the statement in March this year, a necessary modality is for the Arctic Council to rotate chairmanships, as it has been doing continuously since 2006. That's when. The when is continuous. The scientific community that we're talking about has responsibilities that transcend the responsibilities of nations. We, as a community, globally speaking, have responsibilities to address things like climate, independent, well beyond the capacities of leaders today. The ability to operate across generations is a responsibility that we, as a community, have to cherish on a global scale, with inclusion. That's the when, continuously. In terms of where? Well, the where is fairly obvious. It's pan-Arctic. It's not just one state or another. The Arctic Ocean circles the region entirely, involves six coastal states plus Finland and Sweden as non-coastal states, and all of the indigenous people's organizations north of the Arctic Circle. That's the where. It's pan-Arctic. It's marine and it's terrestrial. And Pavel showed pictures of, of methane burps from the ground. Methane in, in the Soviet, in the, in the Siberian Arctic, uh, 
in the in the in the North American Arctic, in the entire Arctic region, is contributing to greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Our responsibility is to study that, to understand it, to be able to respond to it effectively on behalf of the entire world today and into the future. In terms of who, the who is also pretty straightforward. It's the residents of the Arctic and the world. We all are connected to the Arctic. We have response to the Arctic in terms of albedo, in terms of solar radiation, in terms of methane and greenhouse gases, in terms of sea level. All of these elements are part of the who in the Arctic. Food security, the ability for subsistence living, all of those questions that require nations ultimately to address with their policies and their governance mechanisms ultimately trans transcends down to the individuals who live in the Arctic and most preciously the indigenous peoples themselves. The why. The why is for survival of humankind. Make no mistake, the Arctic is at the center of human survival in many ways. It's part of the world. It's connected to the rest of the Earth's the system, but it has a disproportionate influence in many ways. The warming in the Arctic in the, is faster than other, other places on the planet itself, meaning that it is a very sensitive region on a planetary scale. And again, the risks in the Arctic are underwater. We also have existing agreements and those agreements, you know, it's easy to pause in Arctic Council, which is a high level forum, but we have binding agreements as well. Those binding agreements with search and rescue, with pollution preparedness and response with science, with the polar code, with a central Arctic Ocean high seas fisheries agreement, those binding agreements are also important for humankind. Important to preserve, just like the Antarctic Treaty is as the first nuclear arms agreement. The entire foundation of all dialogue subsequent about nuclear arms rests with the Antarctic Treaty. And now the how. How do we get there? How do we as a community of scientists thoughtfully and continuously contribute to the welfare of humankind, humanity, for the benefit of all on earth across generations as stewards for all life, all the mountains, all the rocks, everything about the earth system. Humankind has a disproportionate influence. We call it the Anthropocene. We call it a period when humankind has influenced the Earth system on a planetary scale well beyond just being on the Earth. Our industry, our imagination with various types of revolutions, the industrial revolution, the high technology revolution, all of these features come from science. So, in a sense, in looking at the discussion today and looking at the responsibility of the scientific community, it is beyond the capacity of nations themselves to regulate. And to this extent, one of the lessons that I learned from convening the discussion this year in February and March that involved Russia, that involved many states at the level of the White House, at the level of foreign ministries, one of the, one of the observations is that we have a responsibility collectively to both protect and enhance open science. And to that extent, open science is akin to free speech. And at that level, the nations who would undermine open science are doing exactly what they cherish most against. They're undermining free speech. The free speech of scientists to communicate with each other, to share ideas, to think about change, to contribute data that can be transformed into evidence for informed decisions. These are responsibilities that exist beyond the decision makers that are given powers in institutions and governments. 
these responsibilities exist with the scientific community globally today and across generations. So I make these comments, hoping that others are li listening, hoping that decision makers are listening and ask them a question. How do we proceed in terms of building stability short to long term in the absence of the continuity of scientific cooperation? It's a simple question, difficult to answer. We as a community of responsibilities, and a good illustration is the Arctic Science Agreement itself. It's an agreement on enhancing international Arctic scientific cooperation. It's in force, read it. If you haven't, it basically was signed by the ministers of foreign affairs of states, but to implement it fundamentally requires collaboration, dialogue, effective inquiry, and establishment of processes with the scientific community. Enhancing international scientific cooperation is an impossibility to manage at the level of ministries of foreign affairs. The scientific community itself has a fundamental responsibility to assist enhancing international scientific cooperation. And to that extent, I appreciate the opportunity to share observations with you with the hope that we as a community can add to the stability of the world and change the direction of dialogue away from conflict resolution to one of common interest building. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for uh, this uh, raising this issue of inclusivity, despite uh, all the difficulties that we face today. Uh, you painted a very good picture. Okay, let's move on to the Q and A session. And uh, first, I would like to ask a question myself. And this will be a continuation of what we discussed in the previous meeting, in the first session. I want to ask about uh, microplastics in the ocean. Even though in the last couple of years, we saw some very good examples uh, of fruitful international uh, cooperation. There was a Norwegian expedition devoted to these issues. And still, this particular matter does not have a single methodology, a single approach that would be universally accepted. What do we consider as microplastic? How do we collect microplastics? How do we process microplastics? And currently, when we often talk about bans and sanctions, I, I'm a little bit nervous that uh, this dialogue may be put on hold. Whereas we do need a methodology for handling uh, this matter. This is truly important. We, we do need an inclusive approach in addressing this matter. Otherwise, we won't be able to have a big picture. There will be individual isolated expeditions, but there will be no cooperation. We won't be able to combine their data, their results. So my question to you is, uh, are there any particular areas of research that saw uh, more regression uh, that were curl-tailed recently more than others and where we would hope to see some 
uh, improvements. Paul or Pavel, who wants to take this? Do you think you can uh, comment? I can make a, a brief comment on. Um, I'm, I'm not a I'm, I'm not a natural scientist, so I don't know enough about microplastics. Uh, but this is certainly an area which still requires cooperation. I recall an article in the uh, in the online news source Arctic Today which commented on uh, Bering Strait residents still calling on both the US and Russia to, to uh, continue cooperation uh, since February on marine pollution. Uh, Alaska residents see garbage show up on their shores um, with labels in Russian. So even though uh, they're there has been a pause of cooperation at the highest level. Um, local residents still demand that something to be done about marine pollution coming from other countries. Um, you know, marine pollution is not going to be paused there. Um, and this kind of Bering Strait cooperation also has a precedent to, uh, besides what I was um, uh, saying about um, science cooperation during the uh, Rusalka expeditions and other expeditions. Um, even today, I understand that the U.S. Coast Guard and the Russian Border Guard um, have not uh, specifically suspended their emergency response operations. Um, so even though the Arctic Council is on pause and um, uh, chiefs of defense are not speaking with each other, uh, if there's going to be a, a search and rescue emergency in Russian territorial waters, um, the U.S. Coast Guard should still be able to support that bilateral transnational issue. Uh, and so these transnational issues, especially in areas like the Bering Strait, um, uh, still have a lot of demand for cooperation. Uh, well, that's extremely important because uh, you have set a kind of a framework for our cooperation and uh, we have to improve our um, security. So it would be good to know that in case of an emergency situation, an expedition can resort to these uh, international documents. International cooperation is good for search and rescue. It would be very relevant. God forbids any repercussions and ups and downs in the diplomacy prevent us from cooperating. That always will be ready to help each other. Alexander, you wanted to say something, Mr. Sergunin? Yes, I wanted to say that cooperation between the members of the Arctic Council started uh, in the field of uh, microplastics uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic and some events were identified, were scheduled in order to set up some joint projects uh, to be implemented by different members of the Arctic Council. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, these uh, meetings didn't take place. And then Ukrainian crisis broke out. There is no clarity, either in terms of the methodology, how to assess the microplastics pollution, how to assess the contraction and are they quantitative measurements. But we even don't have full understanding of what is the source of microplastic pollution, what regions are affected mostly. We have certain assumptions and uh, there is a viewpoint that most of the pollution comes not from the Arctic region, but rather from other regions which are located too far away from the Arctic. And in that sense, this problem acquires a global nature. And this problem has to be addressed not only by the Arctic Council member states or the observers within the Arctic Council, but many imaginations 
which are originally the source of that pollution, have to address that as well. And this is very unlikely that microplastic pollution can be resolved only within the Arctic uh, dimension. As for the Arctic nations, step by step, there is a change in the attitude towards this problem in the sense that certain measures have been taken in order to reduce the circulation or the use of plastics in the everyday life. Some of the Nordic countries gave up the use of the plastic bags and uh, plastic dishes and they're replacing that with the more environmentally friendly materials. The same is true for Russia. In most of the big cities of Russia and in the Arctic zone of uh, the Ru Russian Federation, the separate uh, waste collection has is becoming more and more popular. So that plastic waste is collected separately and recycled separately. And I hope that these measures would help us to mitigate the problem. But again, this problem goes beyond the Arctic region. Uh, we have every evidence um, enough to assume that uh, most of the pollution comes not from the Arctic region, but from other regions of our planet. Thank you, Alexander. Paul, over to you. Uh, just a brief observation. Uh, this year, uh, with leadership from the United Nations Environmental Program, began a process to build a binding United Nations treaty on plastic pollution. Um, so in the same context of any of the other issues that we would face on a planetary scale, um, you know, methane in the atmosphere, understanding the burping of, of methane from the permafrost, plastics in the ocean, um, any other impact, sea level rise, um, all of these things, they require cooperation on a planetary scale. And so in the context specifically in plastics, there is progress to build a UN treaty on plastics specifically, which would include as part of the earth, the Arctic. So the, the solutions that are necessary, consistent within regions, local to global, are important to consider. And so plastics is one among many. And I think this is part of the challenge. There are lots of favorite topics to focus on. But as a general sense, how do we as a community address them all? Where is the expertise? The expertise comes from the scientific community. The scientific community is at the heart of understanding change, whether it's natural sciences and hypothesis or social sciences and values and ethics or indigenous knowledge in terms of cultural understanding. The ability to describe patterns, trends and processes is a necessary step to translate the data into evidence for decisions. And it's the decisions, our actions, that governments make. So we, as a community, have a fundamental responsibility. The governments themselves support us, to be sure. But the ability for us to operate requires inclusion globally. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you all for your answers. Now let's pick some questions from the audience. Anne, please, will you pick some questions from, from the chat, if there are any? Okay. I can read that question myself. One of the questions from YouTube. 
может быть, кто-то из нас ответит. The question is related to some of the recent initiatives, which is several days old. Initiatives proposed by one of the U.S. senators. Paul, can you please comment on that initiative by the U.S. senator? The, there is a policy that was recently proposed, a bill that was proposed by Senators uh, Murkowski from Alaska and King from Maine um, that looks at a number of, of uh, features, um, significantly shipping um, in the Arctic Ocean. Um, the details of that uh, bill are pending. Um, so in a sense, it's a work in progress. Um, and again, I would go back to the observation that, that if we're talking about the Arctic and, and recognize that the Arctic is pan-Arctic, that means that any discussion or any solutions for the Arctic are in effect incomplete without all of the Arctic states participating inclusively. Thank you so much, Paul. I do believe that we really need a comprehensive and inclusive dialogue, bring together all the Arctic Council. And now I would like to pass the floor to one of the organizers of that series of meetings, of discussions. Igor Pavlovsky from Pura. Igor, are you with us? Good evening, dear colleagues. I apologize for being late for the beginning of that event, but bear in mind that the first speech was made by Alexander Sergunin. I actually, I think that I heard everything. And summing it up, I would like very briefly to tell you that uh, when we thought about uh, that um, series of roundtable discussions, we thought that we have to go on discussing the problems which are pertinent to the Arctic, and no one could assume that our discussions, our roundtables would become the only sorts of communication on different topics uh, in the Arctic region. And I'm very glad that all the colleagues mentioned uh, one important thing, that one important idea, that there is nothing worse than no dialogue. And uh, whatever the situation is, we have to try to agree on something. Bear in mind that uh, the Arctic region is crucial for the climate on planet Earth, and it is crucial for the development of all our countries. And it would be a crime to stop a dialogue there. And I'm very glad that you supported this our approach. And thank you so much for a very informative uh, roundtable. And I watched that just uh, very attentively. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear colleagues. Our next discussion would be dedicated to transport in the Arctic. So I wish you everything the very best. Thank you so much. See you next time. Stay healthy. Talk to you soon. Bye.